Thank you guys. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Uh, we're we're uh, turning the page in our series on Exodus, and we're going to leave Mount Sinai here. Um, and and right before we do, there's a shift. Uh, if you've been following, by the way, let me just say this: um, th- this series and th- these messages, they're probably best if you catch. Uh, catch the series. So like if you're watching TV and, and then you're, you're watching, it's very popular now that everything's in a series. Um, that's, uh, but a lot of the, the, the episodes, they stand alone. In other words, you can watch it and you can enjoy it. You don't have to know what went before and after necessarily. And, and I would hope that would be true for this. But I am intentionally tying this all together. And so um, if you're newer, Let me just encourage you to go and watch some of these online somewhere where you can tie the whole story of Exodus uh, of Exodus together because I think it will it will help you. They they escape Egypt. Um, They they come to Mount Sinai. They receive the law. Then um, at the end here, they're gonna Moses is gonna be told to build um, a tabernacle. So they receive the commandments, they agree, they say, uh, we agree. And I think this is important because I think the way it was portrayed, maybe I'll say it this way. I think the way it was portrayed to me was God like shouted a bunch of things to people and it was a, it was a take it or leave it. Just told you what to do. But actually what it was is there they were commands and then the people agreed to them. So he was pulling them out of, of bondage and he was bringing them to a promised land. And I think it's the perfect picture of the journey that God takes us on in life, that he pulls us from this to something that's so much better. Jesus called it the abundant life. In, in this story, it's called the promised land. But it's the abundant life. It's the, it's the richest life that there is. It's not an external riches. It's an internal riches. And it's complete fulfillment when you enter this. But there's a journey to get there. And you take on the law. And then you take on something else. He says, I want you to build a sanctuary. Exodus 25. And I'm going to dwell among you. So they agree to the law. And then it's as if God says, okay, now I'm going to come and live with you. This is big. God's not just going to be above shouting directions. God's going to be among them. This is a game-changing moment. And they're told to build a, a a, a tabernacle, a dwelling place. Now, if you're you're reading, it gets... um, it gets laborious at this point if you're, if you're reading it because at this point it gets very detailed. They start talking about you know how many uh, how many loops to make and, and and measuring how many cubits wide and how many cubits high and it's like reading a blueprint. So the story part really comes to a grind here and it, it would be like reading the details of a of a recipe or a blueprint and it's just it's laborious. So. But at the end, something unbelievable happens. Moses finishes all of this work and God, it says, descends in a cloud and he fills this place called the tabernacle. And now God is with them. And what would happen is God, when he wants them to move, the cloud would lift up and they would follow this cloud and then it would settle and then they would settle. What could be better? What could be better than in your life walking step and step and step with God? Knowing that when God moves, you move. When God stops, you stop. That you are moving in, in, a, in a sequence, in a rhythm with God Himself. Nothing could be better. 
And so they have this cloud, and when the cloud moves, they move. And the cloud stops, they stop. The tabernacle means the dwelling place. God is going to dwell with his people. And Moses is given all these instructions. And the people, they all bring an offering. They bring, remember how they got their stuff that they bring as an offering? Remember where they got it? God gave it to them from the Egyptians, right? So now they're bringing in gold and silver and all these things to make all of this stuff. And they, they make the, the gold things like the Ark of the Covenant you, you've read and you've heard about. Um, Exodus 25, it says, overlay uh, with pure gold uh, inside and out. It's all gold. And this is a part of the interior, the most interior part of the tabernacle, the, what they call the Holy of Holies. And there's the Ark. And this is where God's presence would dwell, right there. Anybody know what was inside the ark? The 10 what? 10 commandments. It's all coming together, this is important. I've been trying to make a point through the series that ultimately what God wants is a relationship with us. That's all God really wants. God wants a relationship with you. God, it's not about rules, it's about relationship. But here's the interesting thing. The rules are packaged inside the relationship. There's the Ten Commandments. There's the presence of God. You really can't have a relationship without some rules. I want to have a relationship with you. Uh, Here's here's what I'm looking for. By the way, I do a lot of premarital counseling. This doesn't go over so well. I want to do whatever I want whenever I want to. And... I want to have a wife who's sitting there waiting for me whenever I decide to come home. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That's not a relationship, right? That's, that's a one-way street, right? That, that, that's, that's a servant. <laughs> that, that you can give us all kinds of other titles, but it's not a relationship. When you have a relationship, you have some kind of rules, some sort of an agreement. And this is what they do. They make an agreement with God. God says, here's how I want you to live. And they say, yes, we will do it. And then God comes and he dwells with them. And God's presence rests on that ark. And the commandments are inside of the ark. So what happens in life? I learned this phrase from somebody that really helped me. They said, what happens is we transcend things, but we, in- we include them. So some of the rules and the laws, and, you know, I-, I gave this example of, you know, we give Charlie all these rules. You can't cross the street by yourself. That's a rule. You, you, and you have to have mom or dad with you. And someday, um, maybe an aunt's going to come over. Can the aunt take her across the street? Well, no, only mom and dad, you know. And when she's young enough, I don't care. I'd rather have her, how many know, I would rather have her stand there for three days and not cross that street than to guess as to how she could do it. Is anybody with me? You want them hard? Is anybody with me? Do you, you, okay. you want the rule hard and clear because you don't, right? And, and so you, you keep driving these rules, but what happens is, as she gets older, she's going to transcend that. She's going to realize, well, it'd be okay if my aunt took me across the street. You know, it'd be okay if my uncle, it'd be okay probably if the neighbor took me across. And then one day she's going to realize, I can cross by myself. <laughs> you transcend it. But what you include, you bring it with you. And that's the, the, the underlying thing of the, that you have to look both ways. You have to be safe. And so what happens is as we grow in life, we transcend these things, but we include them. We always know the spirit which, which the, the rule brought. And it was always, so there's harmony with God and with others. That's always the rule. God doesn't sit in heaven and try to think of arbitrary things to make you do. God's all, goal is always that there's harmony. They called it shalom or peace. And the harmony is this. It's peace here, it's peace here, and it's peace here. Harmony. That's all God's after. That there's safety, that there's harmony, that there's peace. 
So, they make this dwelling. God comes in the tent. Now, if you fast forward through the Bible, what you'll find out later is the tent. Um, David wanted to build a, a structure. He didn't like the tent idea. It wasn't substantial enough. And so he wanted to build, uh, you know, like a palace for God. And, and so God said, no, you got too much bloodshed. Your, your son can do it. So Solomon builds the tabernacle. So it goes from the tent to the tabernacle. And then by the time you get to the New Testament, something unbelievable happens. The Shekinah, the, the glory of God that descended the presence of God, leaves the tabernacle and goes where? Onto the believer, into the hearts of the humans. Now, get this. God moves from dwelling in a tent, dwelling in a structure, to dwelling where? Here. Wherever you go, guess what? That's where the presence of God is. That's why in Psalms it says, I can't, if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. There's nowhere I can flee from your presence because God dwells on the inside. The most radical, unbelievable, um, mind-blowing thing in all of the scripture is this, that God dwells where? Inside of you. That's the glory of God. Did you see those two little ones up here? Did you see the glory of God in those two little ones? I think you did. And you recognize that inside of every person is something that is so sacred. Now, if you look at the tabernacle, we don't have time to go through all the details, but let me read one more verse for you. Exodus 26. It says, make the curtains of goat hair for the tent over the tabernacle. So, if you were to read through, and I won't, all the details, there's gold, there's bronze, there's all this silver, there's, uh, but then there is um, these beautiful embroidered curtains, and then there's goat hair. And what you will find about the tabernacle is this. When you're in the very interior, it's gold. And the further you get out, I'll just say it this way, the uglier it gets. By the time you get to the very exterior, when you're looking at it, you're looking at goat hair. But you have to enter into the goat hair. You have to go through the outer layers to get into the interior to see the gold. This is a perfect picture for you. Because what you realize as you grow older and wiser in life is this. The shallow things in life, they put all the gold on the outside. Anybody ever, anybody ever have like a, a gold-plated something and you realize the plate wasn't that thick? Right? It says 24 karat gold and they advertise it very large, very loud, but then you realize it's plated in gold and you realize it's not a very thick plate. One scratch, the gold is gone, and all you got yourself is a rock ring. It's a, it's a thin layer to draw you in. The presence of God, the tabernacle, is the exact opposite. Everything ugly is on the outside. It's a little bit like building C now that I think about it. But anyway, that's another sermon. It's like you, you got to go. I can't tell how many people have come into this church and go, it's a lot nicer when you come inside. And I go, yeah, well, you know. I don't think Textron built it for beauty, if you know what I mean. You look at the tabernacle and it's, it's goat hair. When you step inside, then it becomes more and more beautiful. And then you step inside the, the next tent. And then you step inside the next one. And it's increasingly valuable and increasingly beautiful. I think what's going on in our society is this. And by the way, where was this tent put? Well, it was put right in the middle. So they had... They, had or, they were organized. They had tribes on this side. They had tribes camping on this side. They had tribes camping on this side and tribes camping on this side. So this, this was always in the middle. 
And whenever they moved, they all got up and they moved and they put the, the ark down and they would build the, the tent around it and they would build the tabernacle and then everybody set up camp around this. You see, this is a picture, if you can take it, if you can take this home, this is a picture of how you set up your life, the way they set up the camp. Where do you put God? Or here, somewhere, you can reach him if you need him. Like, you know, most, most people today, God is somewhere in the trunk. No, truthfully, right, you, you, want, you want a little God, because you might need him. Is it, I'm, I'm close. You want to kind of keep God around. You know, you don't want to get too weird, too religious. You know, people think something's weird with you. So you keep God in the trunk. And then if you break down... You get out, pop the trunk. God, I need you here. You know, we got a situation. If you can get me back on the road, get me going again. Anybody ever? And I'm not talking about your car. I mean, I'm talking about anybody ever been on the side of the road? Okay, I'll go over here. This is a very righteous crowd over here. Anybody ever been on the side of the road? They don't, like a life is much better on this side. So. So you're over and you need God. And like, well, where, where's God? Like, oh, I, I think we put him in the trunk. And you got out and you pull God out. And like, we got a problem. Anybody pray desperately when things are going bad? On the side of the road, we need some God up in here. Fix this, fix this, fix this. And God, God in his goodness and in his grace somehow gets out for us. Has he done it for you? And you've said, I know I shouldn't have put you in the trunk. But please, please, let's get this thing going again. Get me back on the road again. And uh, God in his grace. Isn't God good? I mean, just think about it. Like how many times, think about how many times you've snubbed God in your life and then turned around and needed him again. Helps us out. You know, now this is, of course, this is just Chris, but I, I kind of see God like eyeballing the back seat instead of the trunk when it's all over. You know, he's like, at least, at least where there's air conditioning. You know what I mean? And it, could I not, and you're like, yeah, yeah. Cause you made all these promises. Yeah, get right in there, you know? And this is how we operate, right? And then we, we converse a little bit and we talk and you look over your shoulder and, and but then, you know, it's more exciting and you talk less. And you talk less. The next thing you know, you got a few friends, you're starting to pick up people, and the car's running good, man. The car's running good. And you're picking up friends. You're like, hey, hey, guys. And you're like, it's, it's a little crowded in here. And you're like, you wouldn't mind the trunk again. I mean, you did well back there before. And <laughs> this is kind of how we operate. Now, I don't know if you pick this up, if, you're, if anybody's daring to read Exodus with me, but if you pick this up, but it says, do, do you remember when Moses is on the mountain and it, he's getting all these instructions? I told you it grinds to a halt, right? Like it's slow. And he's getting all these instructions and the people are down at the bottom of the mountain and it's taken a long time. And they, they get tired, it says they get tired of waiting. That sounds familiar. Anybody here get tired of waiting? Here's Charlie's new phrase. Dad, you're taking for ages. A new phrase. You're taking for ages. Yesterday we went to CVS and Vicky had to go get a birthday card. She went inside. She goes, real quick, she's going to grab a card. It was not quick. I'm just telling you, even by my standards, it was not quick. And she's finally, I got a call. She had to call mom. Mom, you said it was going to be quick. You're taking for ages. <laughs> we're impatient. And so they were impatient. And they, Moses was on the top of the mountain. What do they do? They, they want to know. They want to worship. They want a God to worship. This is key. Everybody look here. Religious or not, church going or not, everybody wants to worship. You could say, well, they're at the top of the mountain. It doesn't matter. Just wait it out. And 
No, they got to worship. They got to know, where's the God that brought us there? The, the, the pressure's on and Aaron caves. And he's like, well, everybody bring, your, bring me your jewelry. And they bring all this jewelry and they, they melt it down. And it says that Aaron, they, fa- they fashion it with a tool. They make a golden calf and everybody worships this calf. And they say, this is the God that brought you out because they crave to worship. Everybody craves to give your life to something. Even if you don't call it worship, if you don't call it in the category of religion, that's not the point. The point is you and I, we crave to give our lives to something. They had to. Of course, Moses comes down from the mountain and Aaron's there and what do you do? You know, I'm paraphrasing, summarizing for you. But Aaron says this literally, he goes, it's kind of like, I don't know. He's like, we put in all this metal, and I'm quoting Aaron, and out came this calf. <laughs> now, when we're putting God in the trunk, we're just full of excuses. We're full of it. I don't know, out came this calf. Just Anybody can look back at times and periods of your life when you were only fooling yourself? Now I can look back and, you know, the only person I was fooling was myself. Out came this calf. Like, who's buying that story? And the thing is, the people around you all know. Your loved ones know. Your friends, your good friends know. They're trying to tell you. And the only person that you're fooling is yourself. So the place that God occupies in the camp is the same place that God needs to occupy in your life. Front and what? Center. The center. If God's at, this is, this is key, if you can get this, if God's at the center of your life, it doesn't mean you won't hit road bumps. It doesn't mean that. So let me be clear. But if God's at the center of your life, you can think about it, having a wheel that's perfectly balanced. You'll just keep rolling. And you'll get through it, and you'll get through the next thing, and you get through the next thing, and you get through the next thing. It says in the text there that then Moses would go to the tent and meet with God a ways away from the camp. So Moses would have to go journey. God's a distance away, it says. He'd walk out there, he'd meet with God, then he'd come back. Here's what I believe. God always wants to be in the center of your life. I don't even think God's that pushy. But God just waits for you to welcome him there. Will you, will you open your heart? Will you, will, you, will you put him there? And if not, then God occupies the space. Moses goes to visit him. He stays around. Isn't God good that he's so gracious to us? He said, all right, if you you don't welcome me, I'll just, I'll just be over here. I just think what we don't realize is that by taking God and putting God out way over here, what we're missing by not having God at the center of our lives. I once saw a a diagram, I should have have drew it for you, but you can picture a wheel, like a piece of pie, and all the little, you got it, you got it, the pie? All right, if I had the whiteboard, I would do it, but. And I've I've been to a seminar, I've watched guys do this, they say, now, here's how you have a successful life, and I think they mean well. But they they do a pie, and they'll go, this is your financial life, and you gotta have goals, and you gotta have a budget, and you gotta do, you may have been to one of these seminars, and then I have another piece of pie. This is your family life. And you got to, you know, go visit your kids once in a while. and Stop being a schlep. And then they'll do another one. And this is your physical life. And you got to go to the gym and be careful. Anybody seen these? And then they give God a piece of the pie. It's so good of them. This is your spiritual life, whatever you call it. Da, 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 da. How many know God's not a slice of your pie? God's the whole enchilada. This is important. You need, a, you need a centering thing in the center of this wheel that says God. 
God needs to be the centering thing in your life. And then what God does is God radiates out and permeates every other part of your life. God's good at all the other stuff. God overlays every other part of your life. You put God, see, they travel through the wilderness, God's at the center. And if God's at the center, everything else will work itself out. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. All these other things will be added to you. We live in a very stress-driven society because people are always clamoring and clawing for things. And the clamoring, it seems like it never ends. And people are always stressed out and they're worried and they're anxious. And what Jesus comes to do is come to fill your heart and you, you let him have the center place and all this other stuff starts to fade away. It doesn't mean you don't have to get a job. It doesn't mean you don't have to work hard. It doesn't mean any of that. But it means you put God at the center. You seek him first and front and center and all this other stuff works itself out but it's going to look like goat hair for a while. You know, I mean, let's be honest. Your friends that don't go to church this morning and they think, oh, what's, what's inside there? This is a bunch of goat hair. You think what? You haven't, you haven't, some things you got to work for in life. The pro, here's the great problem. This is the great problem in our society. Our society is built on being shallow. The other day, I, I mean, you know, you know, like you used to have a newspaper. Now, I don't know about you, but I just read it on my iPad. I read the news on my iPad or whatever, and uh, half of it ain't worth reading anyway. But anyway, stuff comes up there, and it's like uh, such and such influencer. And now that's a term, right? If you guys are, it's an, inf I'm an influencer. What does that mean? And all it really means is good looking. No, I mean, I come to that, I was like, what exactly does this mean? And I, what it turns out is like, somebody's good looking. I mean, they, they physically look good on the outside and now they're called an influencer because I guess a lot of people follow them. Like, like you know, like maybe you could follow, like, follow them to where they get their hair done. But beyond that, I mean, why would you want to follow somebody that looks good on the outside? I mean, it's nothing wrong with looking good on the outside. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, why would, why would you want to follow them? Like, why would you want to take direction and life guidance from them? How about... I went to see my grandma yesterday. She's 100 now. She doesn't look the same as she did when she was 30. But I would follow her. You know, she's probably not going to crush it on Instagram. <laughs> but we're missing something. Our, our society has turned completely shallow. So anything that looks like goat hair, we run from instead of diving into, you know, I'm gonna, I, I better go see what's in there. Faith, religion, all that, it's all being thrown aside. And instead of saying, man, you, you got to go inside there. Some stuff you got to work for. And now it's like some kids like 20 years old, they're good looking, and then the whole world's following them. What, do, what, are, what in the world are we doing? An influencer. Honest to God, I kept trying to think, of, like, what, what is an influencer? What, what does that mean? It's like, wow, this person, did, did he discover, you know, the cure to cancer? No, they're good looking. So what's the world's trap? They just paint everything with gold. Hmm? Make it shiny on the outside. And I'm not saying that none of these people are smart or they're good or anything. I'm not, because I don't know. I don't follow them and I don't know. I'm not saying there's no goodness inside of them. That's not what I'm saying. But wouldn't it be something if our society, the people that trended that people that were hot online were 100 plus, the people with wisdom, that people had lived through some things, that people had some scars and some stories, wouldn't that be something? Influencer. 
Bo Kramer. I should have went in there with that. When I got to the floor, they're like, who are you looking for? Her name's Dolores, although no one calls her Dolores. Everyone called her Bo. I only, of course, called her Grandma. But technically on the thing, she's Dolores. I'm looking for Dolores. But what if I just said, I'm looking for influencer Bo? <laughs> See, all of this ancient stuff, there's deep wisdom. The deep wisdom is that the, the dwelling of God belongs in the middle. That's where it belongs. And when we're disobedient, then the tent is way out there. And when they're, it's here. It's the trunk or the driver's seat. You can decide where you put God in your life. But you will always live with the results. You will always live with the results. And where God wants to be is within you. And the greater freedom and access that we give God, the greater the result. I want to read you something from the very end of the Bible. I wish I had so much more time today, but just this. Revelation 21. Ah, let me back up. Pretend you didn't read that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a curtain. There's a curtain once you get inside that separates the holy place from the most holy place. It's embroidered it's got cherubim embroidered in it. So as you get inside, it's getting more and more beautiful. And uh, when Jesus dies, in Mark's gospel, it says, when Jesus died, Mark 15, the curtain was torn from top to bottom. Look at that. It's as if God's been trying to bust out of this box and just, Jesus dies in the and the way the, to the presence of God is just opened up. And then we get to Revelation, and then you, have the f you get to the, the, the fullness of God, where it says, now the dwelling of God is with men. It's like, it's fully complete. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And then it says, after that, he says, and I will wipe away every tear from their eyes fullness of the presence of God. That's a day we're waiting for. That's a day that is to come. But in the meantime, you can have the presence of God. And I think if you acknowledge and you make room for and you make way for God in your life, you will experience God in new and deeper ways. I was at a university campus not too long ago and there was a bar crawl going on, and there was a church service going on. <laughs> University town, right? And the bar crawl, they all had matching t-shirts, and they're going from one to the next, to the next, to the next, and there were kids that were lined up, like around the block, you know. Like, they're, they're gonna be hammered. And this one to this one to this one. And you could see them. They were fighting. And there was a, just, you could tell all the ones that were participating. And all the, the little ants like chasing, like sugar ants chasing an M&M. You know, going around town looking at that. And I drove, I, remember, I still remember. I, it's vivid. There's a big church there. There's just, seemed like plenty of room to get in. I said, Chris, but you're just old fashioned and you don't get it. I know. Trust me. I know. And the older I get, I think the more old-fashioned I become. Does anybody, you know what I'm talking about? It's just like, I, I, I know, just put a fork in me. Like, I'm, just, I'm just stunned. Everybody's chasing the glitter on the outside. And no one will go for the goat hair. Because we're all so shallow. I'm not saying any kid that's ever done that's a bad kid. That's not what I'm saying. But you can, see this, you can see the trend in society. We got fooled. 
You know what? The, you know the one thing you, if you ever want to get Charlie something, which please don't, please God don't. All right, so let me caveat. I don't want any more stuff in my house. Thank you. But if you ever did, all you got to do is make it sparkly. That's it. That's the, that, that is the only criteria for a four-year-old. Sparkly. It could be a two-by-four. Put sprinkles on it. Love it. What do you do with it? it? It's sparkly. It can be broke. It can not work. It doesn't matter. It's sparkly. It's the ultimate in immaturity. Our society is being built on the ultimate in immaturity. We're being sucked down this little hole of immaturity. Don't look any deeper. The only way you really experience the inner part is you got you to be willing to dig deeper. You know, it says, 2 Corinthians, you can look this up later. It says, right now we carry around these vessels. Paul said they're like broken pottery, but inside, that's us. By the way, anybody's pottery breaking more than the next guy? We're the vessels with this broken pottery. But we contain, what we contain is the glory of God. When you get mature, you care about what's on the inside, not what's on the outside. The outside's broken pottery. The outside's goat hair. The outside, that's all about what's on the what? inside. Let's stand. We'll have a closing prayer together. All right, here is the... Everybody get your keys out. Time to unlock the trunk, everybody. Are you with me? Let's let them out. I carry God around for emergencies. But God front center, central to your life. Whatever that means, it's, maybe it's a prayer in the morning. Maybe, maybe it's a prayer with your family. Maybe it's regular worship. Maybe it's but your, your, your life starts to revolve around God rather than God revolving around you. I promise you this, God only wants to take you to good places. And if you get that part figured out, it becomes easy. God only wants to take you to good places. Dear Lord, we pray that you will guide us. We pause today to open up our hearts to you. Just like there's an opening in the middle of that camp for the presence of God, there's an opening in our hearts today for you, that you will guide us, that you will dwell with us, that we will always make room for you. We'll clear out the stuff that needs to be cleared out. We'll do the hard work when we need to do the hard work. Look past the external so you can lead us to what is good. Fill us fresh way with your spirit today. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Happy Sunday, Orchard Grove. God bless you.